attended an opposition protest in Miranda State near Caracas. The demonstration, which consisted of thousands of people, was a peaceful gathering with typical speeches and chants. We are very near Plaza Altamira right now, where the opposition looks like it's setting up a barricade. This is a tactic that the opposition does to deter traffic, to cause a lot of problems here in Caracas. Uh, we're going to go follow them right now and see what's going on. As the sun started to set, things began to change. Smaller groups donning masks and shields started forming up. While the majority of the crowd held a candlelight vigil to commemorate those killed in the protests, the others lit flames of their own. They poured incendiary liquid in the streets and began stopping traffic. Uh, we're here in the middle of the plaza. There are thousands of protesters down there for the March of the Torches. Right now, um, there are a couple dozen protesters right here with shields, helmets, masks. Um, they're lighting fires, they're, they're, they're doing a blockade. They say their tactics is to get as many people out in the street as they possibly can. Several times we were aggressively surrounded by masked protesters, demanding to see what media outlet we worked for. Only when they heard that we were from the United States did they back down, but told me to only film repression against them, not their actions. As the crowd grew, they announced they would be marching to block the major freeway. Protesters and squadrons of motorbikes began mobbing through the streets, setting fires and creating roadblocks along the way. So we're here at the highway right now. We just talked to some protesters who said that they're blocking the highway. They just set up a barricade of fire. They're doing it down there. Um, the National Guard is about to come, which they say uh, they want us to see how they oppress them when they do come. Stopping cars leaving the highway, they trapped drivers on the offering. I talked to several in the heat of the offensive. No, 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 por el momento no ha hecho nada, pero por lo menos venimos a representar el día de hoy de que todavía no, 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 hemos, no nos hemos quedado quietos, no nos hemos quedado tranquilos, todavía estamos en lucha, lucha por la libertad y lucha por esta dictadura que tenemos de 17 años. Then the protest moved on to the highway itself, shutting down all lanes in both directions. Most surprising is how they did this, taking over two large trucks. So right now we're on the highway. Every single entrance to the highway has been blockaded, lit on fire, and um, now we're looking at two enormous trucks that have been somehow taken over and maneuvered in order to block the main thoroughfare of the highway right now. Protesters held the freeway like this for some time, according to them, waiting for state forces to respond. Then they commandeered a third truck, pushing it towards the edge of the freeway. Below was Miranda Air Force Base, they started hurling rocks and chunks of concrete at the base below, and that's when soldiers guarding the base responded. They fired several tear gas canisters that landed directly in front of me and my team, and the protesters quickly retreated from the freeway back at the streets above. Uh, apparently there's an Air Force base there and they're throwing rocks yeah. to the big okay. blockade, and then they hurled tear gas canisters over the side. We got hit, <laughs> but not really hard because it wasn't that close. The protest regrouped at their fallback position when National Guard soldiers I couldn't see fired more tear gas. This time, staying on the front lines hurt a bit more.
So yeah, right after I said I didn't get hit hard with tear gas, uh, we're running away, and you know, there's there's all these provocations with the police and the protesters, and they just started hurling tear gas canisters at us, and we were just caught in a com huge plume of tear gas. It was extremely painful. Uh, my eyes are really, really burning. I felt like I was blind for like five minutes, so that just happened. While soldiers had cleared the freeway, protesters continued to block several intersections in the area, with more trucks and barricades. What I had experienced was a typical Guarimba, a few hundred or less semi-armed protesters ruling the streets, shutting down as much as they can, using largely violent tactics. They push as far as they can go until security forces respond, then flee with new photos of repression. Given what the media has been saying, I was shocked to learn that there were no arrests that night. It seems like there certainly is a right to protest in Venezuela, and the curated images we see in the news are obscuring a much darker, deadlier reality. Since the beginning of the protest on April 6th through July 1st, we found 95 deaths attributed to the protests, with over 1,000 injured. Of that 95, 11 have unknown or undetermined connections to the protests and are murders that took place in the vicinity of a protest. So let's look at the remaining 84 deaths. It is true that many protesters have been killed by police and the National Guard. Several have been killed in shootings and two killed by tear gas. According to Venezuela's Attorney General, one of the most outspoken critics of the government's response, 23 deaths are attributed to state forces. Many investigations into alleged killings by state forces are still ongoing. In several cases, people were first reported in the media to have been killed by state forces, but evidence later revealed that they were actually killed by opposition weapons. <laughs> but let's assume that number is correct. 23. So if only 23 out of the 84 are attributed to state forces, what has caused the majority of the deaths? The remaining 61. Those 61 actually have been caused by opposition protesters, many of those killed directly in murders and political assassinations. Let's look at those numbers that so many unquestioningly attribute to state repression. We found 23 to have been indirectly killed by opposition violence in a variety of ways. For example, six people have died in vehicle accidents while trying to escape opposition barricades. Three are civilians who died because opposition barricades prevented life-saving ambulances from reaching them. Nine of those 23 are opposition protesters who accidentally killed themselves. One in an explosion from an opposition mortar. And eight electrocuted themselves to death while looting a bakery. In addition to these indirect deaths from opposition violence, 38 people have been directly killed by opposition violence. 16 of those 38 are seemingly random killings of civilians at opposition barricades or near a protest. Seven of the 38 are police and National Guard members killed by protesters. Six of them were shot by protesters, and one National Guard member was beaten to death by a mob of protesters. One would think these facts would be included in a fair report of force used by the state. But more heinously, 14 deaths are political murders and assassinations of Chavistas and government supporters by the opposition. Most were targeted for attending a pro-government demonstration or for being identified as Chavistas. Two were socialist figures who were kidnapped, tortured, and executed. Most chilling was the lynching of 21-year-old Orlando Figueroa, who was brutally beaten, stabbed, and burned alive by opposition protesters. According to an interview with Orlando in the hospital, they yelled, hey black guy, see what happens to Chavistas, before throwing a Molotov cocktail on him and lighting him aflame. Orlando died from his injuries just days later. At least four other people have been set on fire but lived, allegedly for being Chavistas, and many others brutally beaten by opposition mobs. So of those 84 fatalities associated with the protest movement, 23 deaths are allegedly from state repression, and 61 deaths from opposition violence. As surprised as I was to see that the reality of these numbers is so warped, I was completely unprepared for what would happen to me for simply reporting these facts. Because I question the validity of the fatality count being 100% due to state forces, prominent opposition spokespeople created a false hysteria over an outrageous lie that myself and Empire Files producer Mike Preisner were not journalists, but in fact working directly for the government intelligence forces and that we weren't actually conducting interviews of protesters, but taking their pictures to turn into police forces. 
And not only that, but the police had then arrested protesters based on our intelligence. The life-threatening lie was first promoted by professor at Venezuela's Simón Bolívar University and opposition activist, José Vicente Carrasquero. The rumors were echoed and exaggerated by several prominent opposition journalists, like Manuel Malaver and Miami reporter Angie Perez. The disinformation campaign incited a virtual lynch mob against us for days, which translated into real-life stalking and threats, calls to fine and kill us, doxing of personal information, and more. Revealing their characters, scores of opposition Twitter accounts specifically used the word lynch when calling for violence against us. More than that, this opposition hate campaign also posted the address of an event Mike was speaking at, inciting people to come confront us, and worse. Dozens of Venezuelan expats actually showed up, chanting against socialism, and tried to physically force their way into the event to disrupt it. But the threats of violence were not empty. Just days later, a Telesor journalist was actually shot in the back by opposition protesters, when her and her team were viciously attacked with Molotov cocktails, bullets, and explosives. Many other journalists have also been called infiltrators and attacked, like when a Global Vision crew was doused with gasoline by protesters at a recent demonstration and told to leave or they would get burned. Amazingly, international human rights organizations like Human Rights Watch and the Committee to Protect Journalists have been silent on the attacks on journalists from the opposition and have only condemned the government for press repression. For as much as Venezuela's poor is used as the basis of the international media campaign to oust the government, the poor people from the barrios of Venezuela are not the ones protesting. The marches and violent guarimbas are concentrated in only a few states where the middle and upper class areas are, most of them run by opposition governors or mayors. And the targets of the protesters speak volumes about the nature of the opposition. Factories, public transportation, socialist party offices, hospitals, and clinics have all been attacked. Even the childhood home of Chavez was set on fire. They've also set fire to the government's housing ministry, the Supreme Court, and more. In one case, a maternity clinic was raided, and the facility besieged by opposition forces for two days. A cultural center I visited, which gave free music lessons to youth and provided space for art collectives, had also recently been attacked and vandalized by opposition protesters. Ironically, even though protesters use food shortages as one of their main grievances, they frequently attack food distribution centers. Most recently, they burned a warehouse containing 50 tons of food intended for school children. The representatives of the opposition don't denounce the violent guarimbas sustained by the small contingent of protesters. In fact, top opposition leaders have directly called for violence. But there's another side of this story. The millions of Venezuelan voices who are rendered invisible to the Western media. In 2017, these demonstrators, who the New York Times compared with Martin Luther King, because the demonstrations were civil disobedience. And they compared uh, Leopoldo Lopez, the, um, the guy that, uh, the main leader of the demonstrations in 2014, with Martin Luther King. Well, Martin Luther King never paralyzed city, cities for four months at a time, building barricades, fires, placing big boulders on the, on the, on the streets. None of those demonstrations, at least that I saw, were on sidewalks. They were all on the streets, paralyzing traffic. Uh, almost all of them were paralyzing traffic. Once in a while, they'd let, you know, once in a while, they'd let cars, you know, go through. But, you know, that is what the Chavista governments have had to face, plus the support from the United States, plus the support of the church hierarchy, which has been completely in favor of the opposition, completely opposed to to Chavez and now Maduro, uh, and the media, uh, so that the uh, neo-extractivism thesis writers, the people on the left, some of them on the moderate left, others like Petrus, some of you pro have probably heard of James Petrus. James Petrus? Nobody said? Mm -hmm. Yeah. He is somebody who I admire a lot, but they don't contextualize. Uh, they don't uh, demonstrate that there's a relationship between this ongoing hostility of an opposition that employs legal, semi-legal, and illegal means to undermine the government and to create instability, and 
some of the decisions that are mistaken, that you know, I would criticize, perhaps Petrus would criticize the same ones or others. But regardless of what those errors are, there's a relationship between the errors and the situation that's going on on the political and economic front. And secondly, these writers don't talk about the positive aspects of these governments, uh, for the most part. Or they minimize the importance of the positive aspects. And I'll just briefly uh, talk about some of them. With regard to the social programs, it, Petrus, I, 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 I know this book because I reviewed it for the, the journal Science and Society. And uh, if, I, if I remember correctly, it was Petrus, uh, uh, the book by Petrus and uh, Veltmeier, Henry Veltmeier, uh, who say that the social programs have been successful and beneficial to the poor people because they distribute you know, certain benefits, certain goods, certain services to the poor people. So those programs are good. But what they don't say, and what should be emphasized, is that what's important about the social programs is that they incorporate the poor people in the decision-making process. There are, uh, uh, an, uh, uh, the official number is over 40,000 communal councils that were created by a law that was passed in 2006 that encouraged the creation of these. There was a proliferation of communal councils, and they receive funding. Firstly, they apply for funding on the basis of collective decision-making of assemblies in these communities, uh, and then they solicit the funding. They oversee the carrying out of the public works projects. They insist on the hiring of workers from the community electricians, plumbers, bricklayers, etc. Uh, and they report, you know, any discrepancy between the, uh, the um, project, the blueprint, and the work that's actually being carried out. So this is a participation process which uh, incorporates people, not only the working class, which always has organizational experience because these are people who belong to unions, they go to unions, there's a sense of discipline, both on the job as well as uh, an organizational discipline. But in the case of the marginalized sectors of the population, these are people who work in the informal economy, they don't have steady work, they're not protected by labor legislation. You know, they're basically street peddlers or they're people who work for small companies that are not registered so they don't qualify for the benefits of labor legislation. This block of people represent approximately 50% of the population throughout Latin America. So Chavez, when he said, I represent all people and my job is to improve the conditions of all Venezuelans, middle class, upper middle class, business people, but my emphasis and my priority goes with the poor people. The middle class people in Venezuela hated that because here, you know, never before had a politician in power stated that, that the priority is with the poor people. Uh, and so th th this is one program that benefited not only the working class, but the marginalized sectors, which had never been taken into account before. You just got back from Caracas. Uh, you were observing the recent Constituent Assembly election. Respond to some of the allegations of fraud here, right. of course, in the mainstream media, and also from what you witnessed, was the process more democratic or dictatorial, like the corporate media is saying? Right, so first of all, I went to the Department of Vargas, uh, which is about an hour outside uh, the city uh, center of Caracas. And, uh, and the polling places that I witnessed were inspiring. The voting was very orderly, and they use uh, very good technology uh, that, that Jimmy Carter said uh, amounted to uh, the best election process in the world. It's the same technology and same process he talked about when he made that statement. It's the same branch of government that ran these elections, the CNE. 
um, which is a very trustworthy institution, which is independent from the Maduro government, which uh, has gotten a lot of accolades for their election processes. So I believe I have to, my, my starting point has to, to say that I have a lot of trust in the electoral system there. And I was an observer, by the way, in 2013 as well. Not only on election day, but also I was part of, I got to uh, witness the auditing process later. Which brings me to the next point. If, if people have concerns about how things happened that day, uh, they can have an audit. And I'm sure there will be an audit. And it can be audited because there's paper receipts, the records are kept. Uh, there can be an audit in the way you can't have in the United States. So I have a unlike, lot of- like Unlike the faux vote referendum from the opposition weeks prior, they didn't have an audit. You could vote several times as, as people from Telesor proved with their investigation. You know, and they so, burned and, and all the ballots. Was, they burned all the ballots. <laughs> there was no question from the media about how many, you know, that, that number was taken just. Right. That's right. That was taken uh, at its face. And right now everyone's questioning, you know, whether these numbers are right. Again, in the fullness of time, I'm sure, certain they, they will have an audit. In any case, I think what we know is that a very strong turnout happened in Venezuela, much larger than, than the U.S. government thought would happen much larger than the opposition thought would happen, maybe even more than, frankly, uh, the Chavistas thought would happen. They seemed a bit surprised themselves, happily surprised, which to me shows that there is still a very strong core of support for the revolutionary process there. And when I say revolutionary, I guess I need to be clear. I mean the Chavez-Maduro revolution, not the opposition revolution, which is really a counter-revolution, I think, that's a word that isn't even used much anymore. At least when I was growing up uh, with like the Nicaraguan Contras, you know, they were called Contras, counter-revolutionaries. At least they had the decency to call them what they were, right? <laughs> uh, so I think there is still a lot of support for the revolutionary process. I think that they deserve the support of progressives in this country. And I think we need to support that process. According to the Wall Street Journal, Guaido's declaration as president was planned by Lopez and just three other opposition leaders, two of whom are not even in Venezuela, and came as a complete surprise to the rest of the coalition. Even Guaido was reportedly hesitant to make the move. And it was the phone call from Mike Pence the day before that gave him the reassurance he needed. As a White House official explained to the Washington Post, we have been engaged with the same strategy, to build international pressure, help organize the internal opposition, and push for a peaceful restoration of democracy. But that internal peace was missing, the official said. Wido was the peace we needed for our strategy to be coherent and complete. Sounds like a pretty open and shut case of a US CIA regime change plot. But all of their rhetoric is about the restoration of democracy. So let's take a look at that claim. Here's the most common explanation. Maduro's political ambition became evident in December 2015. Two years after he became president, a coalition of opposition parties called the Democratic Unity Roundtable, or MUD, won a two-thirds majority in the National Assembly, putting Maduro's rule at risk. In response, Maduro quickly forced out several Supreme Court justices and filled the positions with cronies loyal to him. In March 2016, the court ruled to strip the opposition-led National Assembly of its powers. Maduro held a vote in July to elect a new governing body called the National Constituent Assembly, which would have the power to rewrite Venezuela's constitution and essentially replace the National Assembly and leave virtually no opposition to Maduro's rule. Nothing about this is true. Let's look at the facts conveniently left out. First, Maduro did not replace the Supreme Court with his own supporters. The terms of 13 Supreme Court justices were up in 2015. According to the Constitution, it's the job of the National Assembly to approve new justices. So that's what they did. The outgoing National Assembly approved judges aligned with their interests, which is exactly what happens in this country. Second, Maduro did not strip the National Assembly of its power. The opposition took over a majority of the National Assembly in 2016. For the first time since Chavismo took power in 1999, the opposition finally had some political power. So one would think they would use it to push all their solutions to the crises they're always talking about. Instead, they used the National Assembly as a tool of sabotage to make Venezuela's problems even worse. But while they weren't punished for that, they ended up being in contempt of court, as Alfred de Zayas explained. And we all believe in the rule of law. We all believe in the 
separation of powers in checks and balances. And uh, this National Assembly, since day one, when it was elected in 2015, aimed at the, uh, well, at a parliamentary coup against uh, Maduro. The program was called La Salida, the exit. And uh, they completely acted ultra vires. There was another problem with this National Assembly at the time. It had been determined that uh, three, at least three, uh, deputies, uh, parliamentarians, uh, had been elected uh, through fraud. Uh, this was uh, demonstrated, and the Supreme Court was called uh, to make a decision, and they instructed the National Assembly, as it is foreseen in the Constitution of Venezuela, uh, to rerun those elections. And this National Assembly was uh, confrontational. It was intransigent, didn't want to do that. Uh, so it was declared in contempt. So since that moment on, uh, whatever the National Assembly does uh, has no legal validity in the context of Venezuelan constitutional law. It's not for us, Americans or Swiss or French, to say we disagree. That is for the Venezuelan authorities to determine whether the actions of the National Assembly are constitutional or not. Now we get to the Constituent Assembly, widely condemned as a strangely termed self-coup. These are really heavy accusations that Maduro lost control of one branch of government, even though he saw the executive branch, uh, and so dissolved it and created uh, through, you know, dictatorial means this entire new body of government. Here's what really happened. Here's a quick rundown. So Chavez was elected to power in 1999 on the basis of creating a new constitution. That's what he was voted for, and that's what he did when he was elected. When he took power, he started a process of drafting a new constitution. The way that this was done was millions of Venezuelans all across the country had mass meetings, discussions, debates, and proposed things to be in the constitution. Drafts of the constitution went out. People amended them, discussed them, debated them. Uh, and then ultimately, this constitution, new constitution that was created organically and democratically by the people, was put to a national vote. And among the voters that came out, over 70% of voters approved this constitution. And Article 347 of that constitution that was democratically created and adopted reads as follows, quote, the Venezuelan people are the depository of the original constituent power. In the exercise of that power, it can convene a national constituent assembly with the purpose of transforming the state, creating a new legal system, and drafting a new constitution. And so the creation of this constituent assembly was completely within the bounds of the constitution that the people created and passed through a democratic vote in overwhelming numbers. And now the constituent assembly, as John Oliver likes to say, he just created it, stacked it with all his people, his, his relatives, and it was a sham vote. But the constituent assembly process was a democratic process that took many, many months and, and initiated a long, in-depth democratic process. I personally witnessed mass meetings that were held all across the country in the months in the lead-up to the nomination of candidates and the election of people to the Constituent Assembly. Every citizen could go to meetings, understand what the Constituent Assembly was about, how to run, how to vote, and every citizen, everybody and anybody, could run as delegates. The idea that Maduro stacked them with his own people, only Maduro people went, is a complete fabrication. Everybody and anybody was welcome to run as delegates, including the opposition, but the opposition refused to participate. In fact, the government wanted the Constituent Assembly to be a way for dialogue between the opposition and Chavistas. And the government actually begged opposition members to run for the Constituent Assembly, but they refused to take part in this process. So that's why there was mostly Maduro supporters. Of course, it wasn't all Maduro supporters who ran for the Constituent Assembly, but it was majority Maduro supporters because everyone who opposed Maduro refused to take part in the democratic process. And then a popular vote of 8 million people came out to elect delegates. There was over 6,000 candidates across the country country, and 545 delegates were elected to this constituent assembly. And while this process was clearly legal and constitutional, it's important to know why it all happened. Oliver claims that this whole charade was just to dictatorially keep Maduro in office, who was just clinging to power through force and manipulations like the constituent assembly. 
First of all, that makes no sense since the Constituent Assembly has nothing to do with the presidential election, and Maduro had to win in a general election despite his supporters dominating the Constituent Assembly. So why did this whole thing really happen? Well, there are three big reasons. The first reason was to bring a peaceful resolution to the conflict in the country. It was announced while the opposition was organizing violent street blockades, shutting down the country and causing a lot of death and destruction. They said that Maduro was no longer legitimate and that he and the Socialist Party had to step down from office before their democratically elected term ended. The Constituent Assembly was an attempt to resolve all of these grievances peacefully, democratically, and in a dialogue. In fact, the slogan of the campaign was Constituent Assembly for Peace. This also called the opposition's bluff. If they really were so popular, and the socialists had lost support of the people, then it should be easy for them to run and take over the Constituent Assembly and change the Constitution however they wanted. The opposition's boycott speaks volumes there. The second reason is because the National Assembly, which had been controlled by the opposition since 2015, as John Oliver mentioned, had been acting as an agent of sabotage to maximize the impact of the economic crisis, shut down certain government functions, and actually operating outside the bounds of the law. For example, they are held in contempt for unconstitutionally appointing dozens of judges to form an alternative Supreme Court to override the decisions of the actual Supreme Court. The opposition National Assembly was in breach of Supreme Court rulings for the past two years and had not passed any legislation during that time. In particular, legislation necessary to resolve economic issues. You see why the government needed the Constituent Assembly to get around the National Assembly's blockade. Also, the National Assembly could have worked in tandem with the new Constituent Assembly, but they refused the offer. And third, the point of the Constituent Assembly and its task of changing the Constitution was to enshrine certain social and political rights that were not in the original Constitution. For example, a major sector who ran for the Assembly was activists and the LGBTQ community, so that rights for gay and trans people could be enshrined in the new Constitution. Same goes for environmental activists, who ran to ensure that rights for the planet were added to the Constitution. Very sinister stuff, huh? But mainly, this factor sought to enshrine many of the social missions that improve the lives of so many millions of people in ways that we've already covered. From housing to education, the opposition was very clear in saying that it wanted to eliminate these very popular programs that help millions and millions of poor people. So putting new protections in the Constitution would make that more difficult if the opposition were to take power. All of these things seem very reasonable, democratic, and constitutional. While the opposition was free and even encouraged to be part of it, they refused. They refused because they wanted the narrative to be exactly the one that John Oliver gave, a complete and utter lie to delegitimize a government that exercises far more democracy than the United States does. Why was the Constituent Assembly necessary in the government's point of view? Okay, let me tell you this. There have been 25 elections or over 20 years no, in Venezuela. We have won 23 out of 25 elections. Only twice we lost, and we immediately recognized that we had lost, including this election of the National Assembly in 2015. Seconds after the National Electoral Council announced that the opposition had won the elections, President Maduro himself um, addressed the nation and said, we have lost. They have won, and I respect this National Assembly. The Constitution says that the President has to be invited or has to go to the National Assembly before January the 15th each year to give a, an address to the nation about his, the last year's um, uh, evolution of the government. So he went there, and he recognized the new President of the Assembly, which was Henry Ramos Alou, and everything was going institutionally correct. But suddenly, these men and women in the assembly said the only reason they were elected was not to pass bills, to approve laws, but to oust the president. And they said in six months, President Maduro would be ousted. It's still nothing happened. Then um, there was a case in the Electoral Council that went up to the tribunal, the, the high tribunal in Venezuela, the Court of Justice, and it, the, the Court of Justice ordered to remove five um, members of parliament from the Amazon states because they had been elected fraudly by fraud, because that is the only state where we don't have the very 
um, uh, qualified and technified uh, uh, system that we have, electronic system in Venezuela. It's manual. And there was fraud. Two of those um, members of parliament were, were from the Chavista. And we removed them immediately. But the other three were not removed. And uh, then it happened that the National Assembly became in contempt of the tribunal, in contempt of the Constitution. So they self-annulated uh, as, as a branch of government. And uh, the only thing they have to do since 2016 is to remove these three uh, men and uh, immediately new elections will be called in the, Ama in the Amazonas and maybe they can win five out of the five uh, uh, deputies or maybe only three or maybe two, but that's the only thing they have to do. They have not done it because they don't want to, because it's convenient for them to say that they cannot pass bills because the dictator avoids that from happening because uh, there's no democracy in Venezuela. So it's very convenient for them to say that uh, they are um, absolutely dominated, controlled by this dictator, and they don't do what they have to do. No? So this is the real version of the story. And I mean, they could have done this February or March, I don't remember, um, 2016, or they can do it tomorrow. And they will be a, uh, not in contempt, but they would be um, like the rest of the uh, branches of government, they would obey the tribunal and like in every country, you know, if, if the tribunal here, if the court here says that something should happen, the executive branch should do something or the Congress or whatever, you have to do it because there's, there, there are rules for the, for the democratic um, game in every single country and this is our rule. So they are in breach of the constitution. That is the real version of, of, of this issue. Last year we had elections in Venezuela, presidential elections. The constitution calls elections every six years. And uh, they have to be done the last day, the last uh, year of the constitutional um, term. And uh, this was agreed with the opposition. They wanted to make them in advance, not in December, but before, no? they wanted to anticipate the elections. And they went to a dialogue process which was hosted by the Dominican Republic. The president of the Dominican Republic took part of that. Former president of Spain, Zapatero, some ministers of foreign affairs of Latin America as well. And they asked for elections, presidential elections in advance. So finally we agreed. And uh, the only thing that was pending was to set the date. And uh, they said the uh, April 22nd, and we agreed, President Maduro agreed. Mm -hmm. And then when they had to sign the agreement, we believe they received instructions from Washington and they decided not to sign. And uh, finally, they didn't register, or some of the, of, of the parties of the opposition, important parties didn't register for the elections. And they said it was gonna be a fraud in advance before they happened. The US administration said there would be a fraud in the elections before they happened. The European Union said so, and they prepared this scenario. The inauguration of President Maduro, January the 10th, as the constitution says, because Maduro won the election. And then this um, self-proclamation of this man who is uh, supposed to be the president of the National Assembly in Venezuela. And all this recognition of him as interim president, which is absurd, it's a fiction, uh, was prepared, was planned, was designed months before it happened. And what they want is to create this crisis in Venezuela. In Venezuela, everything is still, everything's calm. People are going to school, to universities, to their jobs. Uh, the, I mean, the streets are calm. It's not like in 2017 or 2014 where there was political violence in the streets and there were riots. And no, everything is okay in Venezuela. But they're trying to create the perception that there is a chaos, that there's uh, almost a civil war in Venezuela, and that this man uh, and the U.S. administration are the saviors of Venezuela. And that is not true at all. The 2018 elections are being highly contested and many people are 
arguing that it was not legitimate because the opposition did not participate in it. But some opposition members did participate in it. They had initially, as you said, agreed to participate as a result of the Zapatero's negotiation process. Were there international observers at that election? Well, we had more than 200 observers from all, all parts of the world. But I must say that I myself, as Minister of Foreign Affairs, traveled to Brussels and I invited Federica Mogherini, the High Representative for International Relations of Europe, uh, because they, uh, they have uh, experience in, in these observing processes. And uh, we invited her, President Maduro invited her, and she said she wouldn't come or she wouldn't visit Venezuela. She wouldn't be for the elections. And then I traveled to New York and I asked um, Secretary General of the UN, Mr. Guterres, to travel to Venezuela or a delegation from the UN. But none of them accepted the invitation. That's why I'm telling you, this was planned long before it happened. And if the EU were to travel and uh, leave uh, uh, and be witness of the transparency of the process or the people from the UN, then the American plan, North American plan, would be, of course, um, out of, of, of any kind of, uh, of reality. So they were pressed not to do it, not to witness the elections. The media narrative is kind of a clash of civilizations narrative. On the one side, you have this uh, so-called authoritarian government in, in, in Venezuela, and you have China and Russia and Turkey uh, recognizing uh, the government. And then you have the so-called democratic uh, countries. But the Latin American countries that are aligned with the U.S. are almost all right-wing governments that are doing what the U.S. wants. And you uh, and in Europe, it's very interesting, too, because you have now Germany and France and the U.K. and Spain all uh, gave this ultimatum, this eight-day ultimatum, and this was the result of one person really being flipped, which was the prime minister of Spain, who the other, some of the other countries, especially Germany, tend to follow on Latin America. Pedro Sanchez, who was opposed to the Trump sanctions, decided to go over to the Trump side. Who knows what the pressure was or, or, or what they offered him. So this is really a, a kind of a coalition of the willing, like in the Iraq war. It's not this class of, uh, clash of civilizations uh, at all that, that, that's uh, presented in the media. And if you go back to 2013, you can really see this, because in 2013, Maduro won the election and there was absolutely no doubt about it whatsoever. Uh, no doubt about the vote count, no doubt about the election. And everyone in the world recognized it, except the United States. And at that time, they had just the right wing government of Spain and the head of the OAS. And then those two peeled off. And it was only the U.S. by itself saying this election was not valid and the president was not legitimate. And that uh, and then they had to give in. So you see, even when the whole world uh, recognized the election. The U.S. tried to side with the opposition, who was in the streets with violent protests, trying to topple the government, uh, even though there were no doubts about what, uh, the election whatsoever. So this is just, this shows you how fake the whole thing uh, really is. It has nothing to do with elections or democracy or this, uh, this clash of civilizations that they're creating. It's just about the same regime change that they've been trying to do for 17 years. Now, on top of that, Maduro has either jailed or barred from public office a number of his political opponents. And it is true. These three people have either been barred from running for office or jailed. Uh, let's look at who they are. The first one is Henry Capriles. Capriles is a rabidly anti-gay politician who ran for president against Maduro in 2013. So he wasn't barred from running then. And with an 80% voter turnout, he was indisputably defeated by Maduro. And that's how Maduro became president the first time. It's also notable that he ran in that presidential election after he was part of the short-lived coup d'etat that kidnapped Chavez in 2002. He was recently barred from holding office for his proven role in the Odebrecht scandal. Odebrecht is Latin America's biggest construction company and part of a massive international corruption investigation, which involves it in paying hundreds of millions of dollars in bribes 
Capriles was governor, 2011, 2013. Uh, he was part of this scandal and funneling money uh, from the scandal into himself and his party. So that's why he's barred from running. The next guy is Leopoldo Lopez, a far-right opposition leader uh, who's on house arrest right now uh, for nothing big, just for being tried and convicted for planning and organizing and leading a violent coup attempt against a democratic government in 2014 that ended up claiming the lives of 43 people. He was not, however, ever charged for his role in the deadly failed coup attempt in 2002, where he actually led the illegal kidnapping of government officials when the right wing took over the government undemocratic. Democratically. Hard to imagine anyone avoiding charges after that first one, uh, but yeah, after the second try, he was placed on house arrest. Then there's Antonio Ledesma. And what was he arrested for? Well, in February 2015, a coup plot was uncovered, yet another coup plot, and Ledesma was found to be a lead organizer of that coup. And what were discovered in this plans for a coup? Oh, just assassinating Maduro and then installing a junta government and even bombing several civilian targets, including bombing the state-owned media offices of Telesur. He also, like Leopoldo Lopez and Henrique Capriles, was part of the coup in 2002. So I'm pretty sure these people would be barred from running an election in any country. And it's extremely ironic that John Oliver is saying Venezuela's democracy is illegitimate because the democratic rights were taken away for three men who multiple times tried to undemocratically overthrow an elected popular government with violence to eliminate the democratic rights of the Chavez movement. And then the funny thing about the claim here that Maduro barred political opponents is I'm pretty sure that political opponents ran against him in the election. When the presidential election was announced, the opposition coalition, or MUD, was split over running. While a democratic victory was possible for them, they favored a different strategy. Rather than risk an electoral defeat and showing that the opposition didn't have popular support over Maduro, they'd rather have Maduro run unopposed. That way they could deem the election illegitimate and seize power from Maduro by way of coup or foreign intervention. But in February, leading opposition politician Henry Falcone registered to run against Maduro. The MUD immediately expelled him, and demand he withdraw from the election. The US government was even exposed for privately pressuring Falcone to drop out of the race. So there's this claim that the opposition wasn't allowed to run against Maduro, but the opposition and the US government, in fact, pursued a policy of not running against him to create the illusion that you couldn't run against him. But Falcone screwed up the plan for them and showed that you could run. But then on election day, the opposition largely boycotted the vote. Less than 2 million people came out to vote for Falcone, and he was beaten by Maduro by a margin of over 4 million votes. Immediately afterwards, the US and opposition leaders said that the loss of Falcone didn't count, and then there should be new elections, and those new elections should bar Maduro from running. Very democratic. CNN is learning the Trump administration held secret meetings with rebel officers in Venezuela to discuss plans to overthrow the country's president, Nicolas Maduro. Since Jeremy Diamond is joining us live now, uh, what more can you tell us on this? That's right. Uh, a current and a former U.S. official are telling me and my colleague Elise Labitt uh, that U.S. officials did indeed meet secretly with uh, Venezuelan military officers to discuss a possible coup against Venezuelan President Nicolas Maduro. Uh, these uh, U.S. officials met with these renegade Venezuelan military officers uh, in several covert meetings over the last year, uh, and these meetings happened abroad. Um, Washington ultimately decided against supporting this coup against the Venezuelan president. We know that this White House has taken a very firm stance against Venezuela. They've issued numerous sanctions. And we know that the president uh, has said in the past that he is still considering a military option. He has kept open that possibility. Uh, we also reported uh, earlier this summer that the president had previously uh, talked to aides about the possibility of invading uh, Venezuela. That did not happen, and we also now know uh, that this coup that U.S. Officials, dis officials discuss did not happen. The United States ultimately decided against providing uh, these military officers with any support for this possible coup, uh, and that coup ultimately did not uh, become a reality. Um, but uh, this is, of course, a pretty uh, significant uh, new thing that, that we're learning in mm -hmm. terms of how seriously the Trump administration uh, was considering action against the current Venezuelan government. And of course, given the troubled U.S. history of uh, mm -hmm. involvement in coups in Latin America, uh, this certainly would have been very, very significant. <laughs> given the troubled history of American involvement in South, South American coups. But if you listen to the other report from CNN, Maduro's nuts, conspiracy crazy. That there's some plot that involves America and right-wingers outside of his country to overthrow him. 
They just report that. You know why? Because the CIA told them to report that. Why else would you report that? Why else would you report that? Just remember how CNN reported it, how crazy Maduro was. They haven't shown anything so far. And it's the same pattern that we've seen before. Something happens. It is always the far right. It is always Colombia. It is always the United States or the empire, as they like to claim. Uh, But the attorney general. (laughs) But, uh, you know, my reporting (laughs) says the United States doesn't interfere in other countries. Let's, that's Sky, CNN. Watch this. This is also CNN. CNN can now confirm that President Trump asked a number of his top foreign policy advisors last summer about the possibility of invading Venezuela. <laughs> but that guy's nuts. It's another pattern. He thinks he's crazy. He thinks America wants to overthrow him. Why? Because they're trying to overthrow him. What a crazy conspiracy nut, huh? Do you see how they th- use that term? Do you see how the news media has taken that term from the CIA and now they have weaponized it and now they use it against anybody they don't like or somebody who's telling that or anybody who tells the truth about war? They call him conspiracy theory. Maduro, crazy conspiracy. Oh, except it's not a conspiracy, is it? Has even turned down help from other countries and agencies, including food and medicine. He has turned down food and medicine, telling Venezuelans that humanitarian aid is part of a conspiracy to overthrow his government. That's absolutely untrue. They've received help and aid from many other governments, including Cuba, Iran, China, Russia, Turkey, India, and more. But what they have not done is accept help from the United States government through USAID. First of all, as we already know, the U.S. government has the express desire of overthrowing the government and regime change. So I don't think it's unfounded that they thought that the aid could come in the form of uh, trying to forward that agenda. USAID is a known tool of regime change. In fact, in one example nearby in Cuba, USAID was exposed for having a fake social media campaign, infiltrating community hip hop groups to recruit agents, and had a fake HIV program to gather data for regime change purposes. USAID has a long history of open regime change efforts in countries. It's not that they're not accepting aid, they're just not accepting aid from the people that want to overthrow them through the agency that is known to be a tool to overthrow them. You know, in Dominican Republic, one of the many interventions of the U.S. in Latin America happened in 1965 in Dominican Republic. The administration then of the U.S. went to the OAS, the Organization of American States, and they said they, they, I mean, decided that there was a humanitarian crisis in Dominican Republic because there was a government there, or a left-winged government from Mr. A very important man, Juan Bosch, and they, de- they wanted this man out of power. So they decided and they, uh, they controlled all of, all of the OAS then. So, in fact, some boxes got to Dominican Republic, some nurses, some doctors, some food, and behind them, 8,000 Marines that overthrew the president, the government, took uh, control of the power there of the government and p- imposed a d- dictatorship and that is part of the of the Latin American history and they have done it in other places as well but this is the most obvious one the New York Times has found that footage is contradicting the US claims that Nicolas Maduro had burned trucks that were carrying humanitarian aid. This was a giant story just a few weeks ago, and we now have better footage, complete footage that shows what really happened. Now, the opposition itself, not Nicolas Maduro or Nicolas Maduro's men, according to the New York Times, appears to have set the cargo alight accidentally, a Molotov cocktail thrown by an anti-government protester was the most likely trigger for the blaze. Now, uh, luckily, the New York Times released this footage and also explained exactly what happened. So let's take a quick look at that and we'll fill in some blanks. On February 23rd, four aid trucks arrived at a bridge on the Colombian side of the border. Guaido supporters cleared a path and drove the trucks toward Venezuela. Security forces repelled them, firing tear gas and rubber bullets and the aid trucks got stuck on the bridge. The Colombian government released this annotated footage of the standoff. They circle the Venezuelan police near the trucks before the fire breaks out. The implication appears to be that the Maduro regime caused the fire. But note the timestamp in the footage they circulated. It suddenly jumps ahead by 13 minutes and misses the critical moments leading up to the fire. 
we obtained previously unseen TV footage that fills this gap and tells a more complicated story. So let's back up the TV footage and see what happened. A small group of protesters starts throwing rocks and Molotov cocktails. We'll focus on this one protester. Here we see him throwing two Molotovs toward police. Let's look at the scene again. Four trucks are stranded on the bridge. The protester approaches from here, behind the third truck. He launches one Molotov, but the second one separates, and the burning rag veers off toward the trucks, not the police. Let's fast forward a little, and we'll synchronize the security footage. We can see that a fire has taken hold on one of the trucks. This is just 30 seconds after the burning rag landed in this area. This sequence of events shows the fire was most likely started by an errant Molotov, not by Maduro security forces. In minutes, the cargo is ablaze. Now, the Branson concert was supposed to raise something like $100 million for humanitarian aid for Venezuelans. Now, how did that concert actually pan out in the end? And has there been any accounting of this money on the part of Branson? And what about the other humanitarian aid? Has, and what do we know about that? Right, so this is the February 22nd concert that Richard Branson, the British billionaire um, and CEO of Virgin Records, organized in just a week's time, actually, as Juan Guaido was promising to deliver this humanitarian aid, this so-called humanitarian aid, uh, into Venezuela's borders, which, um, you know, as a... I was in Cúcuta for that concert and for the following day when, you know, they attempted to ram this aid through. And as a Colombian priest who is responsible for basically guiding these um, deserter soldiers told me, it wasn't actually about humanitarian aid at all. It was a tiny amount. And what it actually was meant to do was ram through the borders and, and show that Maduro uh, has a loss of sovereignty, that he doesn't actually control his own country. And that would foment an uprising and, you know, finally depose Maduro. Um, now, that's failed spectacularly. Um, but the day before this concert, which, as you said, um, said they said they would raise $100 million dollars well, they said they, a few days later, they announced they raised only two and a half million dollars. And they never said where that money was going, uh, who it would be uh, distributed to, or any kind of plan. And I'm actually in a WhatsApp group with um, all these opposition journalists who, uh, this was the Venezuela Aid Live official uh, WhatsApp group. And they had been asking, well, where's this money going? And the coordinator, coordinator, said, well, we'll you know, we're going to make a statement. And they never really made a statement. And there's major questions about where this money went and how much of it may have been spent by uh, these you know, same uh, hucksters of Guaido in Cucuta. So um, they did make a statement. The Venezuela Aid Live uh, organizers did make a statement saying that they have nothing to do with the embezzled money and you know, they're looking uh, forward to the investigation uh, as well and that their money doesn't have anything to do with it. But, um, you know, the $125,000, it may be much more than that. Avendano, the journalist who, who reported this stuff, um, has more receipts and more documents that, you know, I assume he'll be uh, continuing to expose. Now, I just want to turn to Guaido himself. You've written about him as well, also for the Gray Zone. What can you tell us about his background and how it came to be that he is the fresh face of the Venezuelan opposition now? Well, until Juan Guaido declared himself president of Venezuela, you know, in January of this year, after receiving a phone call from Mike Pence urging him to do so, um, most Venezuelans had never actually heard of him. He was um, a, a middling figure in a, in a kind of... Um, some opposition party that had been discredited thoroughly throughout even, you know, you know throughout Venezuela for uh, acts of street violence and um, leading what they call guarimbas, which are basically riots in the street that shut down uh, uh, certain areas of the city and have actually, you know, where they've actually murdered um, people who support the government. Um, and Guaido was basically catapulted into this position um, but his history is really remarkable. And essentially, he was trained um, by a CIA cutout um, called Canvas, which is the Center for Application of uh, Nonviolent Strategies. Um, and this is a Serbian group that came out of the um, Yugoslavia, the collapse of Yugoslavia, 
um, where the CIA basically poured huge amounts of money into student groups. And um, uh, there was a group called OPOR that was a key, a key student group that led to the downfall of uh, Milosevic. And then this group basically became professional regime change trainers. So they're going all around the world training um, student groups mostly um, to overthrow their governments, basically governments that the U.S. You know, doesn't like, certainly not you know, uh, governments the U.S. is in line with, Saudi Arabia or Israel or anything like that. No, it's only targets of the U.S. empire. And so Juan Guaido uh, and many of his popular will party colleagues attended these trainings. Uh, Guaido allegedly took part in what's called the Mexican uh, Fiesta plot in, um, in a Mexican hotel in 2010, where he went to one of these trainings, and they also plotted uh, an assassination attempt of uh, the president, Nicolas Maduro, which failed. But basically, Guaido has been a, cent- a figure at the center of street violence for many years, um, and he was vaulted into this position for, uh, in order to basically have this U.S.-backed scheme um, of a coup that has you know, failed. Uh, repeatedly since it was declared in January. Juan Guaido swore himself in and was backed by the rest of the free world. And he has been recognized as such by the rational half of the world. Now a long list of countries joining the U.S. supporting Guaido. The sea of yellow you see there now recognizes the opposition leader Juan Guaido. This coup is painted as legitimate by the media and political establishment because of the international support from major U.S. allies in Europe and Latin America. But let's take a quick look around the world to see what that support really looks like. As usual, the African continent is erased from the dialogue. There, 51 countries recognize Maduro. Only one, Morocco, recognizes Waido. Then there's Asia and Oceania, where again, only Australia recognizes Waido. The other 33 nations recognize Maduro. Moving on to the Middle East, where staunch U.S. ally Israel is the only country to recognize Waido. The rest in the region continue to support Maduro's presidency. Next, the Americas and the Caribbean. Despite 17 countries across the continent recognizing Waido, 19 countries still support Maduro. While the majority of U.S. allied Latin American powers back Waido, in the Caribbean, the Bahamas is the only nation to do so. Lastly, there's Europe. Powers like France, Britain, and Germany have united behind the U.S. to support their puppet in Venezuela. Even so, stark opposition to this coup exists within Europe, including Italy, Greece, Norway, Switzerland, and the Vatican. So by international community, they really just mean a minority led by the white imperialist and colonizer nations, erasing non-white nations as members of the international community. The people have access to the internet and social media, including Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. But what about the local press? When I was walking around Caracas, I was surprised to see many adversarial pro-opposition publications being sold at newsstands. So, you know, one thing that we're told in America is that the press in Venezuela is completely controlled by the government. So I went to a couple newsstands and bought up every paper that I could find, and surprisingly, The vast majority were not. Uh, Let's take a look at them. Ultimas Noticias, it says, uh, so far 1,200 buildings have been destroyed. Um, I'm told that this is a neutral paper and that some days it has pro-opposition stuff, some days it has pro-government stuff, so this is a pretty neutral paper. This one's called Diario Villa. It says, public power should condemn the violence. It also talks about the young man who was burned alive. And it also says, the opposition is provoking a civil war. So that's Diario via a leftist paper. Another leftist paper. It says, Maduro, we're going to give constitutional rights to the missions Chavez gave us. And it shows the pro-Chavez march, the huge one that was mostly ignored by opposition people and by Western press. So this is another leftist paper. The other four are completely anti-government papers, all opposition papers. The first one, La Razón. It says, sovereign assembly, sovereign bull****. Um, It says, the coup continues. People do not want their speech to be stolen. The next one, 
Las Verdades de Miguel. So on the front of this one, it says, stop the violence. It basically insinuates that police are causing all the violence. It says, we're brothers, right? Depicting the protesters as totally peaceful guitar players. Who knew? Um, amazing. And then you have Zeta which is uh, another opposition paper. It, it portrays Padrino as some um, dictator. Padrino is the head of the National Guard here. He looks like Pinochet in this photo. And it's essentially saying the blood is on his hands, right? Todo está en sus manos. Um, really, really amazing here. And on the back of the paper, it shows a young journalist, 27 years old, who says he died for the liberty of Caracas. Incredible. Tal cual, which is uh, the most shocking one of all, perhaps. It says Maduro van 43 victimas. It's already been 43 victims, essentially all Maduro's fault. Well, we've seen the breakdown. We know, you know, we know the truth there. So, and then of course you see other stories where it's talking about government corruption, Maduro receiving illegal funds, etc. So, out of the seven papers, four are anti-government. Two are pro-government and one is neutral, we go either way. So it looks like the press is not as controlled as we think. The next day, I even saw a different paper with the most outrageous headline of all. Trump must take care of Maduro. Television ownership is similar to print media. The Committee to Protect Journalists claims nearly all TV stations in Venezuela are either controlled or allied with the government of Nicolas Maduro. That is blatantly untrue. According to the Center for Economic and Policy Research, private TV media captures between 74% and 92% of the country. A 2013 Nielsen ranking found state TV captured as little as 8.4% of people tuning in. One of Venezuela's biggest TV stations is Venevision, owned by right-wing billionaire Gustavo Cisneros. Pero no todo es lo que se refleja en los medios de comunicación. Yo tengo familia en Colombia y, y mi familia Prácticamente a diario me escribe angustiada, que mira, que vente, que... Y no, yo le digo, no, mira, pero no es como lo pintan allá, o sea, aquí no nos estamos muriendo de hambre, pero ciertamente tenemos una guerra económica, porque, este, ¿cómo es posible que eh, tú vas a un supermercado del este y tú consigues de todo, pero tú vienes a un supermercado que está hacia el oeste de estas grandes cadenas y no tienen nada? Venezuelans are experiencing food shortages with the majority of people saying they eat less and worse now than in recent years. The lines that people wait hours in are not simply to buy food in general. They're mostly to buy bread due to the scarcity of flour. But with so many claims of empty shelves, I went to several supermarkets around the city with a hidden camera. So we just went to um, about five different supermarkets and the shelves were fully, fully stocked. And this is all types of neighborhoods, all types of classes. The shelves were stocked with everything from Nestle chocolate, uh, all Coca-Cola products, uh, fish, meat, vegetables, fruit. Um, although it is true, I did not find toilet paper at any of the stores. There's a multitude of other paper products from Kleenex to paper towels to napkins. So while it is true that there are shortages, it seems like you are very able to find things for everyday life, uh, no problem. I sat down with economist Pascalina Curzio to understand the issue of scarcity and other economic problems. Sí, bueno, en primer lugar, eh, hablamos, nosotros hablamos más que de una crisis económica generalizada, hablamos de una guerra económica, ¿no? ¿Por qué? Porque si hubiese una crisis económica generalizada, pues Venezuela no estuviese registrando los niveles de producción que actualmente registra. Eh, Venezuela, los últimos cuatro años, ubicándonos desde el año 2013, tiene un PIB, un Producto Interno Bruto, 9 por, per cápita, 9% por encima de los últimos 30 años y una tasa de desempleo del 6,6%. Entonces no pudiésemos hablar de una crisis económica generalizada. Lo que hablamos es que hay algunas agresiones muy focalizadas que afectan al pueblo en general y que tienen que ver con manipulación de los mercados y manipulación de, de la economía en general, ¿no? sobre todo a través de la moneda. So there seems to be an abundance of all types of food, paper products like napkins, Kleenex, yet of course there's main staples that are a huge shortages, right? Toilet paper, namely, um, things like oil, flour. How is that possible? How could there be such an abundance of paper products, yet no toilet paper? 
Sí, es justamente parte de lo que decía de la diferencia entre una crisis económica y una guerra económica. Son productos muy puntuales con unas características muy particulares, los que han estado escaseando, los que generan esas colas, esas filas, incluso la proliferación de mercados ilegales, ¿no? Ante una escasez, escasez, eh, digamos, causada. Primero son productos de muy alto consumo, ¿no? Por parte del venezolano. Son algunos alimentos, por ejemplo, el caso de la harina de mes precocida es el primero en la lista de los que más consumimos los venezolanos. Eh, son productos muy asociados a la vida, a la cotidianidad, a la salud, en el caso de los medicamentos, por ejemplo. Pero además tienen una característica adicional, que son productos cuya producción y distribución e incluso importación en algunos casos son responsabilidad de grandes empresas que se constituyen como oligopolios. Es por eso, por ejemplo, las naranjas, el plátano, es muy consumido por el venezolano, pero no han faltado en la mesa del venezolano. Ahora, esos productos, las verduras, las hortalizas, las frutas, son producidos por muchos productores, eh, trabajadores del campo, que no tienen capacidad de cartelizarse y no han faltado. Sin embargo, estos otros, pues, eh, digamos, son productos cuya producción está en manos de grandes monopolios con esa capacidad de, de cartelizarse. ¿no? Igual el caso de los productos de higiene, por ejemplo el papel higiénico, los pañales para bebés, eh, las toallas sanitarias son como los emblemáticos que han faltado de muy alto consumo, que afectan los hogares, y en, pero que son producidas por no más de dos o tres empresas a nivel nacional. The main excuse from these corporations for not keeping up with production is that the government doesn't give them dollars. Like Polar, the largest privately owned company in Venezuela, which is also the largest food manufacturer. According to the Minister of Agriculture, Polar is responsible for eight of the main items in Venezuela's food basket, such as butter and oil, and 62% of the corn flour used for making arepas, the country's most popular dish. Polar CEO, billionaire Lorenzo Mendoza, is an open member of the opposition who's been accused of hoarding essential goods. A leaked audio recording revealed Mendoza was secretly plotting with the IMF for intervention. And what is your response to people who say that it's the government's fault for, for the shortage because they are setting the price controls? One of the arguments is that the scarcity is the fault of the government because they have not given the to the companies to que import or the goods for the production or the final product. However, when we start to analyze the allocation of assignation de divisas, a estas empresas privadas, bueno, en los últimos años, desde el año 2013, han entregado alrededor de 300 mil millones de dólares a las empresas importadoras para que importen esos productos. Incluso desde el 2013 para acá, que es cuando se está viendo este fenómeno, se han asignado las divisas, tanto al sector salud, medicamentos, como al sector alimentos. Entonces, digamos, ese argumento no pareciera ser, ¿no? Let's talk about the black market. Uh, for example, you can get over six times more bolivars exchanging dollars on the black market. I mean, this is insane. I've never heard of anything so, <laughs> you know, disproportionate. Um, I know that there's black markets that exist, but I've never heard of a dual economy like the one that exists in Venezuela. What factors led to this? Ese mercado negro, el valor de la moneda en el mercado negro, Lo que hemos dicho es que es un valor totalmente manipulado, ¿no? De manera arbitraria y, por supuesto, desproporcionada, ¿no? Cuando nosotros y se manipula a través de portales web. The main market source for the Bolivar's exchange rate is a website called Dollar Today, run by a right-wing former Venezuelan colonel who moved to the U.S. after helping lead the failed coup against Chavez in 2002. Pues no se corresponde con ninguna variable económica, ¿no? Uno de los principales elementos que le fortalece una moneda es la cantidad de reservas internacionales. Cuando empezamos a relacionar, pues nos damos cuenta que las reservas internacionales no han caído en proporción para estos niveles de eh, tipo de cambio en el mercado ilegal. Y la principal razón es porque las divisas en Venezuela, el 95% provienen de la venta de petróleo y de la exportación de petróleo. Aquí la empresa privada no genera divisas. Por lo tanto, el Estado es el propietario y el administrador de las divisas y controla la asignación. Pero de un tiempo para acá, desde el 2007, pero con más intensidad en el 2013, ha habido manipulación de esa moneda. El problema con la manipulación de ese tipo de cambio, el verdadero problema es que marca los precios internos de la economía y es cómo se genera la inflación. ¿Quién se apropiaría de esas divisas en un mercado libre? Pues quienes tienen más capital, ¿no? 
One quick question also about the black market. It seems like week after week it's it's escalating so quickly to the pace where it could be a thousand more bolivars just week to week. I mean, how does it escalate so quickly like that? Es que eso no tiene explicación económica. Si por ejemplo entre octubre y noviembre, los primeros días de diciembre del año pasado, del 2016, pasó del 2000 bolívares por dólares a 4000 y tantos bolívares por dólares en menos de un mes. En ese momento, ¿alguna explicación económica o tuvo que haber ocurrido un desastre en la economía, las reservas internacionales se hayan caído de manera abrupta? Eso no pasó. O sea, no tiene explicación económica. And inflation is just one of many reasons why, uh, why many Venezuelans are struggling to find or even afford basic necessities like medicine or food. And those shortages have had some terrible consequences. Well, if that's just one of many reasons, what are the other reasons? Uh, he doesn't list any of them. Uh, well, here's a big one, an economic war that's undeniably being waged from within the country, from the biggest corporations, and from outside superpowers that have the ability to, you know, sanction the country, prevent it from getting loans, increasing the price of his foreign debt, and things like that. You'd think that would be worth mentioning. So we've covered these factors really extensively uh, in our reports on the Empire Files. I encourage people uh, to watch those for way more in-depth analysis of the problems of Venezuela's economy. But here's some important facts to know regarding inflation and regarding food shortages. So regarding inflation, 70% of the country's inflation is due to the rate of exchange with the US dollar. This value of Venezuela's currency is arbitrarily determined by outside superpowers, mainly from Miami and Bogota, but perhaps the biggest cause of inflation is what's called extraction smuggling, where big capitalists, those who have the ability to have large sums of cash, actually smuggle cash out of the country over the border into Colombia and other places and exchange them there. This reduces the amount of cash in the country and raises inflation. In addition to smuggling out cash to cause inflation, there's a huge amount of extraction smuggling of food products. In fact, 40% of products in the country are estimated to leave the country through extraction smuggling. And of course, these are things that are known to be tactics of big business owners in the country, opposition politicians, and the U.S. government for, and to intentionally cause inflation. But of course, that isn't mentioned here in the report. Regarding food shortages, I mean, this is the number one thing we see, of course, the empty shelves on every single major media outlet. I did not see empty shelves anywhere. I saw a shortage of food. And I think if you are honest about Venezuela, you will acknowledge this fact. There is not a generalized shortage of food. There is a shortage of particular food products. And what do all those products have in common? Well, they're the ones that are produced and distributed by the biggest corporations and monopolies in the country who are literally part of the political movement to oust the government. You know, how could this erupt into a civil war here? And how can dialogue happen if the opposition is neglecting it. I mean, Maduro's already agreed to it, but the opposition's refusing to do it. Well, Maduro has been asking the opposition for dialogue uh, since the elections in 2015, and he has given the opposition ever opportunity. Uh, but if one side uh, thinks we don't have to dialogue because uh, the big guy in Washington with his big stick is going to hit Maduro over the head and is going to catapult uh, Juan Guaido in the position uh, of uh, uh, president of the wealthiest uh, oil producing country in the world. Uh, so uh, civil war, and I told that to members of the opposition, you may topple Maduro, but the seven, eight, or nine million committed Chavistas are not simply going to roll over. They are not going to disappear. So you may find yourself in a situation of a bloody civil war. Do you want that for your people?